So good afternoon, everybody. But yes, I wanted to just sort of share with everyone today and, and update everybody um, as it's been quite a, an exciting year for, for the Youth Engagement Service. Um, we have Nadia and Sarumpa with us today, who are both new team members. Nadia is our project officer, so she will be leading on events um, and, and coordinating um, our Huntington's Disease Youth Voice Group as well. Um, and we also have Sarumpa, who is the new youth worker based in, in the southeast of the country. We also have Ian in, in um, sort of central England uh, and North Wales and, and Jack, who's down in the southwest. And I'll talk a little bit more about the expansion as, as we go on. So, yeah, I just wanted to sort of go through um, our youth engagement service, explain a little bit about the work we do, how we operate and what we want to achieve really sort of briefly what is Huntington's, Huntington's Disease Youth Engagement Service we offer direct support to anybody aged 8 to 25 who has Huntington's in their family we're an open referral um, service which means that young people can access our services as much as they want um, from 8 as I said up to their 26th birthday really so during whilst they're 25 as well we also offer um, support to parents and carers about how to talk about Huntington's as a family with, with their children and how to manage difficult situations that might arise and whether that's with sort of the dynamics of the family, the young person themselves or the person who has Huntington's and, and the impact that's having on, on, on family. Um, we're very much here to try and support everybody within that family but our focus of course is going to be on the young people themselves. We also work with professionals most typically I would say schools so we do a lot of work with schools so that they also have a better understanding about Huntington's and they are in a better position to help support our children and young people as well as having more compassion and understanding for the family circumstances and able to uh, make adjustments on their end so that um, children are able to get the most out of their education and of course we work closely with professionals as well to make sure that that child and that young person's voice is heard um, a central part of our work as you can appreciate but we need to make sure that everybody around that young person everyone around that child is hearing what their needs are and hearing what they want to happen for themselves not always possible of course but it's very important that we that we get that um get that heard um, other professionals we work with include cams i've done a lot of training with cams across the country um various therapists social workers whoever may be working with the young person um young carers as well is, is another good example of of the services that we work with and we provide training to so our aims of course are to empower young people so that they have the confidence to manage difficult situations the resilience to cope with challenging situations and give them the knowledge and understanding that they need to to make sure that they are able to make decisions for themselves and their future going forward. We offer emotional support and give people the space to talk without fear of judgment. As you can probably appreciate, a lot of young people can find it very difficult to initiate that conversation around Huntington's, whether that's a lack of vocabulary, whether that's just that they've never actually spoken to anybody else outside of their family before. Um, simply from you know our badge saying that we're from the Huntington's Disease Association can alleviate a lot of barriers for young people when it comes to talking about Huntington's and that's another big part of why we want to sort of spread that knowledge and spread that awareness by doing the um, work with professionals coming along to meetings doing the training all that sort of stuff so that again you know if, if we talk about school-aged child if they had had if they have had a difficult evening or a difficult day and they need somebody to talk to they want that space within school then there isn't that barrier there they don't have to worry about saying how they're feeling saying what's happened and then for that um pastoral worker teacher whoever it may be to turn around and say oh what what is Huntington's because that can be quite daunting you know a young person wants that safe secure space where someone understands what they're talking about so it's just about taking down those barriers and allowing them to talk without fear of being misunderstood we share practical advice so families can best cope with symptoms and behaviors from from caused by Huntington's disease um to best support children and young people, of course, it is always better to work as a family so that everybody is aware of each other's needs, how each other are feeling, able to sort of express what's going to be best so that the family can be as cohesive as possible. 
give accurate information, which is it has improved. I, I think. I, I mean, some of my colleagues have been here for a very long time. Um, I've been here now since uh, about 2017, so about six years or so. Uh, and when I joined the association, um, the first thing I did, well, before joining the association, actually, before my interview, the first thing I did was I Googled Huntington's because I needed to know more about it. I had a very, very basic awareness of it. Um, and straight away on Google, there was sort of lots of misinformation about genes skipping generations coming down through only the mother's line only the father's line those sort of myths that surround huntington's things have improved but still it's very important that our children and young people who access our service get accurate information get the correct information so that they are best able to plan for their future so they best understand what's going on and and they can um hopefully as well um, use that information to, to enable them to, to cope in difficult situations. A really big part of our youth service and, you know, the, the charity as a whole, really, is, is to remove stigmas associated with Huntington's. It is very important that our children and young people do not carry um, negative sort of thoughts and feelings towards Huntington's or, or again, um, those stigmas that can be carried um, from from that lack of awareness and that lack of understanding. And we really want our young people to be aware of our community. Uh, we're, I'm very privileged as a professional to, to be sort of a part of the, the, the wider Huntington's community. It's an incredibly supportive and empathetic and compassionate space where families can come together from, well, really around the world. Um, I mostly see it, obviously, within the UK, but it is it's a worldwide community and it's very important that our young people can access that and get that social and peer support as well. We're a youth service, so encouraging healthy lifestyle and well-being is um, a staple of, of just about probably every youth service out there. So whether that's encouraging people to um, take up sports, take up um, um, dance classes, meditation, mindfulness, whatever it might be, um, that we, we, we identify as a potential support for, for our young people or a potential outlet as well. Um, of course, we want to give people the chance to create their own social networks, their own peer networks, and we want to be able to help families talk about Huntington's. It can be quite a daunting prospect for a parent to have that initial conversation. Um, there are examples where I've given scripts, there are examples where we've given literature, and there are examples where we've, we've spent um, a considerable amount of that time just talking it through so that the parent is in the best possible position they can be going into that conversation because it is a very daunting prospect and we want to be here as a service to make sure that you have all the knowledge that, that, that you can and, and one of the things that I say to a lot of families is you know a lot of parents as well you may know one or two other families um, but we're, we're in a fortunate position where we know hundreds of families across the country and so we can sort of amalgamate and share everybody's experience what's worked for some what's worked for others what hasn't worked at all for anybody what's been great for for, for everybody and we can share that that with you directly um so we, we, we can sort of be, hopefully be um give make you as well informed as possible and, and, and help you along that journey and of course as well we just want to be as flexible as possible so that we are meeting the needs of everybody who uses that this service because we recognize that no one person is the same we are all individuals and regardless of what um, brings us together in common or, or that we share across the world it, we still have our individual needs and, and as a service we need to make sure that we're doing what we can to meet those how do we do that um Various ways. Uh, typically, we tend to meet our children and young people um, for one-to-one -one visits, and that is wherever they feel comfortable. If kids are school age, typically it will be in school. School is a safe space where um, they're not at home, and whilst home is the ultimate safe space for, for most people, it's also kids can be very aware that parents might be in the other room, or they might be upstairs, or they, they will generally possibly not be fully open because a lot of kids are very sensitive to their parents feelings as well and and their needs and so they're going to withhold maybe how they're really feeling and the more negative emotions that they're experiencing for fear of upsetting their parents so school provides that safe space for young people where they can talk freely without the fear of upsetting anybody else in the family home typically we have our first visit at home and i like to meet the family um, it's nice of course for the family to meet to meet us as well 
Um, we do have sessions at home for young people who want to sort of keep home life and school life as separate things. That's not a problem. Uh, and for our older age group, we can meet in, in coffee shops and things like that, you know, you know, grab a brew and just have a bit of a catch up. But ultimately, it's down to the, that young person. And if we're able to, to accommodate that and we're able to meet them there, that's what we will do. We have all our telephone calls, you know, messaging, um, WhatsApp, Facebook, text, the various platforms that people can use these days. And of course, video calls. I, I will be very honest with you, before um, March 2020, I had not had a video call as part of this role. Um, and since then, I probably couldn't think of a day where I haven't had one. Um, they are a fantastic sort of um, medium, to be fair. But one of the brilliant things that we are now able to go back to doing because of um, being able to recruit Nadia, Sarumpa, Ian and Jack is that face-to-face -face work. So for some for people who want more regular contact with us, we will be offering that virtual um, hybrid approach where we will be seeing people in person and virtually. However, um, for people who are quite comfortable not needing our service as much we will be able to sort of see them periodically in face to face or video call or there are lots of young people that just want to talk to us over messaging where we we don't mind as long as that young person is getting what they need from our service we, we are very happy um because we want to talk through the challenges faced from huntington's and we want to make sure that children and young people have that safe space where they can share how they're feeling um and, and sort of have a space to vent as well. Um, we are a confidential service, so we don't share what is discussed in our sessions. We don't share what is said without explicit consent for those specific elements that, that we do need to share. Of course, we have a duty of care and safeguarding responsibilities as well. Uh, we want to, we outline that at the start of all our um, referral processes. And if anything does occur as well, we make it very clear what we're going to do, why we're going to do that. So that there is, transparency above everything else and um, we want to share practical advice to cope and manage with symptoms you know if uh, a parent is particularly um, apathetic perhaps you know we like to make sure that the young person recognizes what that is why it is occurring and, and not to confuse it with maybe some of the other negative stigmas and stereotypes that are not true of people with Huntington's so that that's how we generally talk about it or maybe if there's um, a parent who um might be quite uh, i think one of the terms we tend to use is um mentally inflexible which is uh, i guess a bit of a, a fancy way of saying stubborn and if someone is experiencing that sort of very rigid mindset because of huntington's and and is very um stuck in their way is not able to sort of adapt and, and be flexible in a situation we, we we try and encourage young people to perhaps leave the situation or to, to you know to speak to somebody else and speak to the other parent or whatever it might be so it's all those different um coping strategies and able to manage things so never actually how to be a carer or any hands-on caring that that is not our role and that is not what we want our young people to be doing it's just about how to manage and cope in those situations and they are young people at the end of the day, and we must remember that we need to be sensitive to that because we need to be there to work through their everyday issues. If they're having a torrid time at school because um, maybe some of the other people aren't um, as friendly or as kind, we want to be there to support them. And if that means, again, then we liaise with school and let them know what's going on, being that voice for the young person, then we are more than happy to do that. We also provide therapeutic interventions. Um, we do drawing and talking, which is a 12 week program where we run 30 minute sessions at the same time, the same day every week. So we create that consistent, safe space, which we do through time as well as how we do it. And in those sessions, young people will draw pictures and they will talk about those pictures. Um, there is, it's based in Balby and, and Jungian um, psychological models. And essentially it helps people to process difficult emotions or, or, or traumatic events uh, and that um, can then lead young people on to being able to express how they're feeling to be able to talk um, more openly about what's going on for them. Um, it's recommended by CAMS as a precursor to CAMS work and to talking therapies so it can be very effective sometimes it's all that people need and sometimes it's a great first step along that along that journey as well. We do lots of arts and crafts um, for I've, I was going to say younger years, but everybody enjoys a bit of arts and crafts. To be fair, whether that's making cards around, you know, Christmas or birthday cards or memory boxes, 
whatever it may be. Um, we, we've made uh, Huntington's Heroes um, out of various different pieces of like pipe cleaners and um, I think Thrumper and I were doing it using, um, I don't even know what it's called, Magic Foam, I think it was called. Um, and, and just, you know, hopefully fun and, and creative ways just to help people to talk about Huntington's and, and do different things. Um, group activities with bowling events. Uh, we've done water sports this year, which was really exciting. Um, and they are ongoing. We're going to be doing much more of these local events. So hopefully we'll be bringing people together from relatively close by. We provide that listening ear. Um, sometimes there isn't a solution, but we're always here to listen. And I think that's that's really important that our young people have a, a minimum that space just to share and to vent and to get things off their chest. Education, as I mentioned before, whether that's typically around Huntington's, of course. And of course, signposting and referring. We are not the only youth service in the world. We don't pretend to be able to solve and every single problem and we will do our best but if there is somebody else who is better placed we are more than happy to to at least tell families what's out there um and we can also help with the referral process if not do the referral process for for people so typically that might be young carers but it might be someone within school as well so some of the difficult emotions that people can experience um people can experience sort of guilt um for what their parents are going through, what the family are having to manage. There can be attachment issues for young people as well. Um, that's the, the Bowlby um, uh, psychological model that I mentioned earlier um, that, that, that can cause barriers for young people to create healthy um, relationships. People can struggle with low self-esteem. There can be a lack of control and an uncertainty, not just of the onset of Huntington's, but of Huntington's in general. Um, Huntington's does take control away from families and one of the things that we try and champion to, to, to parents and to families alike is that try and give that control back to the young people where it's possible it's not always possible you know that the, um, I have a daughter um, she may think she's in control sometimes sometimes she definitely is and sometimes she isn't but wherever we're able to give that control back it gives children a bit more certainty and it allows them to to, to to feel more in control which can again just create a bit more of a, a positive environment for for our children and young people there can be disagreements in in approaches from parents it's, it's, it's perfectly normal perfectly understandable um i've worked with lots of families where the one of the parents strongly believes that the children should already know about Huntington's and should have been told years ago and, and the other parent believes very strongly that they should they should never be told and so we want to again create a space for parents to discuss this openly and um compassionately as well and um, so that again with the focus being on that young person generally speaking our advice is to to talk to children young people as early as possible really about Huntington's because children assimilate information very easily compared to compared to certainly adults and as, as we get older um so it's that whole old adage of taking it in their stride kids are able to assimilate things easier because it's just the norm it's what they grow up with it's no different to anything else that they've known so they're sort of seemingly much more comfortable um and as well, it's it's quite nice as if, if they are very young when they find out about Huntington's that there isn't that moment of they can't pinpoint. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, on my 13th, would it be 13th birthday, but just for example, 13th birthday, I remember that I was sat down and, and this happened. And of course, there are going to be those situations and circumstances where that's, that is that is the only way that it can happen. And there's nothing wrong with that. It can be helpful if young people are like, oh, yeah, well, actually, I don't ever remember being told. It was just something that I've always known about. Um, and, and young people can experience the stigma and discrimination the same way that, that any family can. And we need to make sure that as much as we can, we, we eradicate that through our work as a charity um, and, and awareness raising. And so that the, the wider community and the general public have an understanding of Huntington's and what it is. And of course, loneliness, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's likely that young people probably don't know anybody else with Huntington's in their family, don't know anyone outside of their immediate family. Um, I would say that is true for the vast majority of young people that we work with. And that can be quite lonely, it can be quite challenging for young people. So whether we connect them 
we're just us. At least we're another person um, within that community. Admittedly, not a peer, but we are another person within that community. Um, there are lots of things online now as well. There are some fantastic resources. We, uh, as an association, we put out lots of blogs, um, webinars. Again, it is dependent. I wouldn't expect an eight or nine year old necessarily to watch a webinar, but of our upper age, that would be much more appropriate. But there are little short videos of people sharing their journey, um, which I think is really beneficial just so that uh, our children, young people, get to see that actually this isn't just me. This, this, this is something that there are lots of people around the world experiencing, um, and, and I'm, I'm a part of that, giving them that sense of that community. So there are lots of family dilemmas and um, psychological implications that, that we need to work with our young people through as well. Um, probably, I wouldn't necessarily most common, um, but the most obvious would be to test or not to test. Um, sometimes there can be pressure within families. Sometimes there can be pressures from relationships, um, even work. You know, if our children, young people are growing up and they've really got their hearts set on joining the army, for example, there can be complications um, from being at risk of, of inheriting the gene for Huntington's. So we, whatever those pressures are, we need to work with our young people so that they, if they do choose to test or choose not to test, that is the right option for them. Um, so we do work quite closely with our genetic counsellors um, across the country. I say hours, they're, they're not hours, <laughs> but you, you know what I mean. And uh, the genetic counselling services across um, England that I, I've worked with are absolutely fantastic um, and, and a great space, uh, again, for, for information and knowledge. Um, so I would recommend to anybody and as I say to all our young people you are not signing up to be tested you are not having a test you are having a conversation about Huntington's and if testing is the appropriate choice for you people will have experienced multiple losses and multiple bereavements um, also the continuing bereavement and that comes with the journey of Huntington's and we want to be there for young people. We've got little activities that we can do. We want to make sure that our young people are processing, coping as, as best as they can. Having children, PGT, which is uh, pre-genetic testing. Um, so when you are having um, children, um, it works very much in the same way as IVF does, but they screen the sperm or the egg for the, the gene. Um, and so the, the, the child will be born um, gene free from, from Huntington's um, uh, as well as the stigmas that can be attached at particularly our, our older age of, of um, people that we support if they are getting to family planning or if they're just having just general conversations with their friends about fu their future and having children it does happen that a friend will turn around who is not well informed doesn't understand the implications of hunting terms or what those experiences are for their friend and I, I might say something quite um judgmental or harsh or something that really upsets the young people that we support and so we need spaces for, for our young people so that they can vent they can share and and we can also just sort of help to explain that actually you know the, it's very hard for the general public to understand hunting terms it's very very complicated and, and and try and help them to rationalise those experiences as well, because it's likely that they're going to meet people, they're going to have friends who don't always see eye to eye, and and that's okay. It's about recognising that, acknowledging that, and accepting that, but not having their views um, altered or pressured by that external peer pressure, or those external peer views, uh, visions of the future. You know, it, is, it can be very challenging. Young people can grow up acutely aware that this could be their future if, if they do have the gene for Huntington's. Young people cope with this remarkably well. I, I'm always um, taken back by how well young people do cope with, with that. But there are certainly wobbles, um, especially around that, that point of 17, 18. Um, anecdotally, a lot of young people are very keen on testing and they think it's something that they, they really want to do. And then actually, as testing becomes an option, um, as you can appreciate, at that point, a lot of young people start to take that decision um, much more seriously. They start to perhaps realise that it's not the right time at the moment. It's something that maybe they want to do again 
or look at again in the future. So um, there are sort of markers, shall we say, if one of a better phrase, um, around the people's journey with Huntington's. And of course, what have been the experiences of a young person being parented by a parent with Huntington's? You know, we, we know the, 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 some of the very difficult symptoms that the people can experience. And what is that then like for the family around that person, for our children, young people? How's that impacted on their development, their understanding of relationships and things like that? Um, in some cases, there might be family secrets that have been revealed, um, perhaps a revealed adoption or, or an affair from years gone by. And, you know, lastly, but by no means least, what are the um, challenges that young people face from being a young carer? How significant is their caring role? Is it impeding on them from having a... Um, social life that's akin to their, their other peers, their other friends? Is it something that they they sort of hold on to themselves, actually? Is it something that um, young people start to worry that they they shouldn't go out and sort of put those blocks in for themselves because they're, they're worried about their parents? So one something that I, I, I've learned through this, this role is that it's not all just, right, you, you let's get you into young carers, you like knitting, let's get yourself in a knitting club, let's get you doing whatever after school and blah 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 and getting them really busy and active yes that can be helpful that can be good um but sometimes actually the young person doesn't necessarily want to do that and they've made a conscious choice not to get involved in these activities because they want to be at home they want to be there for their parent they want to be there for their family to make sure that everybody is well looked after and cared for and so we 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 need to understand that as well and that's something as i say that's one of those learning curves that i've experienced much more in, in recent years in this role it's kind of hard sometimes to explain to your friends that you can't um, like go this place or that place because you know I have to stay and um, you know even though my dad's there you know with my little sisters I still have to be there you know to, to kind of watch my sisters. I was stuck home like basically like I would go to school, come home, um, take care of my mom from the time I got home till she went to bed, and then repeat basically, and I was home like every weekend taking care of her. So I never really got the opportunity to get out and do stuff. And even when I had the opportunity, I was kind of hesitant because like I was one who took care of her most of the time. So I f felt like if I left her, I'd be like abandoning her and didn't know like if someone else would take care of her while I was gone. So I don't know, it's really hard. Um, so things to consider for us when a new referral comes in, when you think about what is their journey like, when was the first time they heard about Huntington's, who in the family has Huntington's, what was going on at that time, why then, how did they feel, how old were they, and what have they experienced that they found challenging, and how have they reacted to support from family, from friends, and also external services. Um, so when they first heard about Huntington's, was it planned? Was it something that they overheard in a conversation? Were they told by another family member against the parents' wishes? Um, what was that experience like? We One of the things that I, I say to a lot of parents is all relationships, be that friendship, romantic relationships, or parent-child relationships are all founded on, on trust, or at least trust is one of the cornerstones of all relationships, shall we say. And so the longer that children, young people are unaware of Huntington's, in the family when they do hear about it for the first time that can sometimes knock that trust a little bit it's not i wouldn't say that parents have been lying or anything like that it's not that, that's not what i'm saying but because something has been withheld that can knock that that trust for for some young people so that's another reason why we do encourage families to have these conversations early on um, with, with young people so that if they do grow up knowing it they don't have to, you don't have to worry about that trust there's no sort of um there's nothing to cover up shall, shall we say uh, and when they did first hear about understands how much were they told were they young was it done slowly sort of over months weeks years days and sort of drip fed and young people had that time and that space to come back and ask questions as, as, as they needed it or was it something that they were sort of given everything all in one go how did they respond to that? Did they feel overwhelmed? Did they were they thirsty for the knowledge? Did they want to know what was going on? Because actually, that understanding can give a lot of context and a lot of relief for young people as well. Who in the family has Huntington's, and how does that impact on their their, their risk, their chances of getting the disease? 
is it something that is sort of in the household is it a parent or is it an aunt and uncle who live separately to them is it a grandparent and how does that affect the family dynamics you know is is it a, a family that's a very tight-knit group is it a family that's a little bit more um spread out i, I guess i've spread out emotionally <laughs> is what i mean really um so all of these things is just really good for us to know and, and for, for, for us to talk through um this video is focused much more on the impact of Huntington's on schooling and how young people can struggle in school. Has HD affected your schooling at all? Uh, a little bit. Like I, uh, When I was younger, I'd get so caught up in how often my mother was yelling at me and how all the behavior affects. And I couldn't get my schoolwork done and for the longest time. I just wouldn't do my homework because I didn't have time because it was always mom. It affected my grades a lot for a long time. Elementary school through high school, I didn't have very good grades. I probably made C's and B's, D's. You know, I was, I was average, I wasn't flunking, but I was really having a hard time. I mean, honestly, I wasn't learning a whole lot in school. I wasn't paying attention. Um, and I just thought that maybe I wasn't that smart. Um, you know, I didn't really have any big plans of me being, you know, going to graduate school. And, um, and then I realized over time, um, you know, the brain, I was, I was really depressed when my mom was in the heat of her disease. And um, the brain cannot cope with things like, you know, going to school and trying to make friends and trying to learn history and trying to learn math. When, when, you're, when you're back at home trying to take care of a dying parent, essentially. You know, Huntington's can be quite consuming. It is going to be something that our children, our young people worry about. And that's perfectly normal. That's absolutely okay. And part of our role is making sure school understand that. Um, and part of our role is enabling young, giving young people coping strategies so that it's less um, challenging for them to, to, to concentrate when, when possible. But it is important to consider what else was going on when they heard about Huntington's, when we're becoming involved, you know, there are young people who might have known for five, 10, 15 years, but don't come through to our service until they're 15, 20, 24, 25, even sometimes, you know, so what was going on? What was that sort of point where they thought actually I could really do um, with some external support? Um, was it just that they'd not heard of our service? Was it that um, work had reached a, a point where it was just unmanageable? Was there lots of pressure from school, exams, friendships, pressures on relationships? What's going on at home as well? Was there significant amounts of stress? Was the family dynamics being tested? Was there sort of a point that, that, that everybody thought, right, actually, we need to look at some, some extra support? Or was it just, you know, as part of sort of that initial conversation and those ongoing conversations around Huntington's, it's like we'd been mentioned, they knew the service was there, so oh, I just fancy a chat with somebody else about this to just you know for young people they'll test us even they'll, they'll, they'll ask they will ask us you know can I get the gene what are the chances all this sort of stuff because they are challenging conversations they are difficult and they want to make sure that we are going to tell them the truth which which we are um was there a reason that they found out that at that time as I mentioned before had something sort of reached breaking point or had they noticed something was there a letter on the side were they starting to become more aware of symptoms were they asking questions what what instigated and initiated those conversations and finding out about Huntington's and how did they feel as I mentioned earlier that cornerstone of relationships was there a sense of loss of trust was that damaged did it bring them that relief that sense of understanding it's like, oh, okay I get it this is why, um, you know, I can't play football with mum in the back garden as much as we used to. This is why dad's finding it harder to eat at meal times. You know, that that can bring comfort as well, that understanding. Um, were they scared? Were they confused, actually? Let's be honest, Huntington's is confusing. It's very complicated. Um, and I have been known to say one thing in a sentence and then say the complete opposite in the next sentence. It is that sort of condition. It is complex. It is confusing how much are young people actually able to take on you know um did they feel that sense of bereavement early on in the journey you know or 
was was it a couple of years and, and and the parents or the family member were starting to exhibit more and more complex symptoms and they started to realize that actually the, the parents not going to get better from that did they feel guilty you know if you've had a um i don't know a, a bad couple of weeks with 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 your child um not to stereotype or pick on the teenagers, but maybe they're a teenager. Maybe it's a particularly tricky time. I'm sort of talking from my own personal experiences there, but 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 it happens. And did they feel guilty? Were they thinking, "Oh man, I've you know I've been a bit difficult the last couple of weeks, and I've just found out now about Huntington's, and oh maybe I shouldn't have done what I've done. Maybe they're feeling bad. So again, you know, all these things to consider. And did they want to talk? Everybody responds differently. Some people shut themselves off in the room and not talk to anybody. Some people will be straight onto the phone and talking to all their friends. And some people will just want to sort of acknowledge it and, and talk about it quite a lot. Where they're asking lots of questions, all that sort of stuff. So it just helps us to build that picture of the child and the person that we'll be working with. Um, and how did their journey feel? as well for them at what point in their journey are they now accessing our support um and and have they sort of shared anything with you as parents that, that concerned you or made you worry um or made you feel really quite positive um, and how proactive were they with self-care um which is a huge part of, of all of our our worlds really isn't it um and self-care is is something that's the easiest to overlook and the easiest to not do sometimes so it's really important that we we promote that as much as we can um and finally i will finish on some of our young people's views i won't read these out um but i will let them just sort of sit there for a minute and you guys can read through them um just as I sort of go over our referral process um, and, and as I say, our exciting expansion. So um, we take referrals from anybody, um, professionals, family members, self-referrals. We need consent from parents to work with anybody under the age of 16. Um, so if a 16 year old does want to seek our support and wants to do that without parental knowledge, that that is their right. They can choose to do that. We are a confidential service, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and generally speaking, once we get that referral, we'll be, we will be in touch with parents or direct to the young person. And from there, we will either come out, have a first session, as I mentioned, as a family together, we'll do consent forms. And if we need to do referral forms at that point too, we can do all that sort of stuff then. And then going forward, it's based on what the young person wants. How they want to have sessions, how they want to interact with our service is totally up to them. Um, as well, so our sort of areas, um, I cover Yorkshire and the North East, including Lancashire and Cumbria, so the, the North of England. Um, Ian covers from Greater Manchester, Merseyside, North Wales to, to Lincolnshire and down to Birmingham. Um, we have Sir Rumper, who covers the southeast of the country, so Northamptonshire, oops, um, Northamptonshire, Norfolk, down to the, the south coast, um, across to, I think, Jack covers Hampshire, doesn't he? Um, whereas um, Oxfordshire and Berkshire, so that's the sort of the dividing line there, and, and right away across to South Wales and and um, Cornwall. Um, but if anybody has any questions at all, I am more than happy to to answer. Thank you very much for for taking the time to join us. I really appreciate it.